I have a confession to make. I've never flipped a house. Okay, I have renovated homes to put them on the rental market. And we've also syndicated a lot of subdivisions or build to rent communities where we build homes and put them on the rental market. But I have never just bought a house, fixed it up to turn around and sell it for profit. So what am I missing? I'm Kathy Fetke and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Our guest today, James Daynard, has flipped over 3,500 properties since 2005, and he's also held some of those properties as rentals. He currently owns over 1,000 rental doors in the Pacific Northwest. James is a managing partner at the Heaton Daynard Real Estate Brokerage, and he's also a good friend of mine. He's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show to share how he's created so much success flipping and also to tell us about his new book on how he's done it, The House Flipping Framework, that you can get through Bigger Pockets Publishing or on Amazon. James, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. I'm so excited. We've done so many podcasts together, but I haven't sat here and interviewed you, so I'm very excited about this. I know. It's been, it's, it's long overdue, long overdue, crazy schedules, and yeah. I mean, it, 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 you've been doing this for how long now? Oh, we don't, do we have to ask that question? No, we don't. We don't. <laughs> Just we don't. kidding. Well, I had a radio show since 2000, but um, I started this around 2003, so it's been over 20 years. I can't believe I have anything more to talk about. Well, it's a seasoned <laughs> podcast then, which is important because there's too many pop-ups now. <laughs> well, I started, it's, it's interesting. I started for totally selfish reasons, right? I just wanted to learn as much as I could. And that was 2003. So it was pre-podcasts. The only way you could really get information tended to be like those late night TV things where you'd sign up for courses or you'd go to a real estate investment club and, you know, again, sign up for a $10,000 course, but the information wasn't readily available like it is today. So people are lucky. Today you have access to so much information, including James' new book, The House Flipping Framework. So we're going to talk about this a little bit because most of our listeners are buy and hold investors, but I know a lot of them do flip as well or would like to want to know if it's right for them. And I'm telling you, if you're not sure, this is the book to read. I, there's no one I would trust more than James Daynard with this topic. So let's go back to the beginning. You start in your book with chapter one, probably the hardest way to get into this business. <laughs> let's go back to your college days. Yeah. So I, I got involved in real estate. Actually, it was purely just to learn. I was a senior in college and I had done an internship my junior year with an elevator sales guy. And as I was coming into college, I wanted to get more sales experience. And so I was graduating from the University of Washington and, you know, I figured what are the best ways for me to learn about sales and people and to be get ready for a professional career after college was to go out and knock on doors. And so um, my roommate at the time, who's my business partner today, took a job with an investment company and, and we signed up as wholesalers or, door fi or deal finders for them where we would go take a stack of leads, go out and knock on the door and see if they were interested in selling. That sounds terrifying. Just a w knock on someone's random door that is probably facing some form of distress, I'm guessing. that That's why they're on the list. Yes, they were all foreclosures. And yeah. so um, they were not welcoming doors. They were open. no. <laughs> think so. No, it's, you know, cause it, at the, it's, when you go out and knock doors, you're invading. I mean, you are, you're walking on another property, you're, you're knocking on a door and you're trying to talk to them about a situation that's very sensitive and they don't know you. And I remember the first door I ever knocked on. I was honestly by myself, I was terrified. Yeah. And I was like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, just go do it. And I knocked the door and it was probably the best and worst door to knock because this lady chewed me out like I never had been chewed out before. And it was the first door I did on my own. I remember I ran back to my car. I'm freaking out. I call my manager at the time. I'm like, I think I did something wrong. He goes, no, no. She opened the door. You did something right. Go to the next oh, house. Oh, jeez. Now, what kept you going? I mean, I think I would have stopped right there. But what kept you going to the next door? Well, I'm very stubborn. So it was more <laughs> like, you know, I was watching these guys making money and investing in real estate. And I was very young. I was the youngest guy in the office. I was 23, 24 years old. And a lot of these guys were in their late 
30s, early 40s, or even older, and I was watching them make money, build wealth, and they also weren't working that hard. And I was working substantially more hours than them putting in the work, and I was having no success. And so just based on stubbornness alone, I was like, I can do this because they can do it. Then that that makes a big difference if you if you know that you're around people who are succeeding. Okay, so they obviously knew something you didn't know. What when did it finally click for you and what was the difference? Well, it, it came down to, you know, and that's why I'm such a you know, it's about who you surround yourself with, but it's also about who the steps that you take and mm-hmm. having accountability in yourself. And so when I signed up with this company, I didn't get a lot of training. I didn't know a whole lot about real estate. I didn't know I knew what real estate was and the potential, but I didn't know the details, like what a foreclosure was, what a HUD was, what the process was. I didn't know all about foreclosures, the, what the people were dealing with. And they gave me a stack of leads. I drove around for two days with somebody and go, hey, go do it. And so I was just going out there, banging the door, putting in the work without educating myself. Mm-hmm. And the big turning point after nine, it was about 10 months, I made zero dollars. Oh my I was gosh. terrible, got no deals done. And that's like, pretty stubborn. That's pretty stubborn of you to do it for 10 months with no success, but to keep going. Wow. Yeah. And that was throughout college. And so it was more just sales experience, but I was like, I'm getting out of this business. <laughs> and, but I kept seeing this potential and I'm like, God, there's, there's something here. And I started getting more and more into real estate. And so my senior year, when I graduated, I got an offer from a medical device company. It was going to be over a hundred thousand dollars a year, which was a substantial amount of money back then. And I was looking at it. And I was looking at the potential and I said, you know what? I'm going to do this for 60 more days. Actually, my wife now was like, just hang in there. Why don't you try doing the 60 days? But what it came down to is I had to pull the plug. I was done with school. I had a a bartending job that was paying all my bills. I had to quit that job. And it was either sink or swim. And what that came down to is I had to educate myself. So I spent a ton of time like researching HUDs, processes, you know, what solutions people could have for foreclosures. Um, I started really understanding, meeting with brokers, figuring out how to look at a prop house, what it's worth, what repairs were. And the more I educated myself was the big difference in when I would go meet with someone at the door because I could provide value rather than just ask them to sell me the house. And once I did that, pulled off, you know, all my safety nets were gone and I just went after I had to build the right foundation. That was the education and learning and then then taking that with the effort. So I was doing all the effort without the right plan. And then once I kind of came up with that plan, it went off like a rocket ship. I went from doing no deals to one to two. And then, you know, within six months, I was doing eight deals a month knocking doors, which was unheard of in our market back then. Isn't that amazing? That is a similar story to me, different business, similar business, but different where I had my radio show at the time 20 years ago, and I was trying to get sponsors because I needed money now. Um, When Rich was going through his health crisis, it was like, we need money now. What can I do? So I thought sponsorships and I, same thing, picking up the phone, calling, trying to get something versus trying to give something. And people can hear it in your voice. I mean, I would get hung up on and like, no, we don't have any marketing dollars. It was just no, 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 no. And I I remember same thing, this aha moment of what would have someone say yes? You know, like, what would it be? And it was just like, oh, well, it's got to be great for them. (laughs) You know, like, it's got to be something they want to say yes to. And and that's when I picked up the phone. and was like, hey, I went too far on this. But I was like, do you want to be my (laughs) co-host? And that's how I got a big sponsor and was able to get through that hard time. How were then you able to give value to people versus just taking their house, so to speak? Well, it was about creating the solution for them, not buying their house. And so what I really switched gears on was going to knock on the door with no intention of buying the house. It was going there with the intentions of helping them get into a better situation. And that was the big difference. And I think that's what all these businesses in real estate are about is finding the solution and not just banging your head against the wall, but by understanding what they were going through, I could go there more to consult them and talk to them and give them advice And then also give them my option, which was, hey, we can buy the property. And then it was more than just buying the property. It was about establishing a new life for them. So then I would put them in credit repair, line up movers for them. We go find them a new rental or a rent to own so they could still have ownership in a property after they cleaned up their credit. And so we gave them a solution that was better than what they had because they went from a house that needed a lot of work that was not a great place to live with a lot of financial stress 
to where we were able to give them cash and then put them in a nicer new house where they could own the property. And so it was about really helping them get into a better situation. The byproduct of that was we got to buy the house. And that was really focusing on what they needed, not what I wanted. And yeah. that has been the key to all of our businesses for the last 20 years is really focusing on that. And that was the big difference maker because people, you could connect with people. And once you made that connection, then you became a viable option for them. And yeah. we would help them with any solution not to sell their house if they didn't want to sell their house, but we were their backup plan. And because we were the backup plan for a lot of different people in our area, we got a lot of deals done. Rich used to say, I don't know where he got this from, but it was needy neediness is repellent. People can smell it. If you're just trying to sell something because you need money, it's not going to work. But if you can solve a problem and help, that's when things take off. So yeah. where is your business today 20 years later? So 20 years later, you know, we went from wholesaling properties to we started flipping homes. Um, then we started a lending business in 2009. Um, so we have now a family of companies up in the Pacific Northwest from off market real estate where we still wholesale. We flip properties. Um, we do a lot of apartment renovations. We syndicate. We also own a lot of rentals ourselves just on smaller, um, you know, kind of value add construction in Seattle. Um, we have a financing arm and then we have an educational arm. And so every business that we have all talks to each other and they all complement each other. They're all businesses on their own, but they're all a piece of the transaction. And, you know, as we've grown, again, based on that same, we've been able to grow revenue, grow profit by doing the same thing, creating solutions for people. You know, in 2009, we started a lending business because why? It was really hard to get debt. The banks were crashed out. And so we could find a good deal, but we couldn't get them debt. So we started that company. Now we make money and it solved the problem. Then it was about controlling your cost and making profit and having the right plan. That's where at our brokerage that helps investors buy properties, we create more. We, we found out what our clients needed and we help them through the construction as a part of our listing service. And so by looking where the needs are and creating the business, we have a family of companies that all produce revenue for us. And so uh, and they all work with each other. They're all they're all key components in a transaction and it allows our clients to have a solution on it, on any type of deal. We can help solve that problem for them. Yeah. It's really incredible what you've built. So in your book, and this is published by bigger pockets publishing, it's the house flipping framework, the tactical playbook to scale your real estate portfolio and reinvest your profits. Do you think anyone can flip. And I ask this because I don't, I don't flip. I'm scared of it, but I, if I were going to do it, it would be with you, right? Or I'd read this. This book is phenomenal. Um, do you, do you think a busy professional who's working 60 hours, 60 to 80 hours a week, or let's just say 40 hours, but they have kids and you know, other things they need to do. Do you think they should be looking into the flipping business or is that for people that who have more time? No, you can do it with a nine to five job. There's, you know, cause there's so many different ways that you can flip a house. I mean, even for people that are scared, they hate construction. They have no design. Um, they don't want to find the deal. They don't like the transaction, but they like the returns, right? There's always something like no matter who you're talking to, who doesn't want to make a 20 plus return. Right. It's that is everyone wants to make that, including myself. And so, you know, if you're the professional that can't really have the time or the knowledge, you can always partner with the operator. And that's why yes. I do believe that any, you know, person can flip. Now, what are, you, what are the ways you can partner with an operator? So you want to, you have to vet the operators and, and find them. But, you know, like a lot of what we do, even as a flipper, right? When I run out of capacity, because that's what we're talking about, nine to five career, you're maybe it's even more, you're really busy. You don't have the capacity to manage this other business. Because when you start flipping homes, it's not flipping homes, you're creating a business. Yeah. And, and once you come to capacity, like my teams have max capacity. How many projects can we run? How much, um, what's our deal flow? You know, there is this breaking point I've learned from flipping homes. You know, we've made a lot of mistakes and we've learned a lot of lessons. And what I've learned is my team can only do so much to be efficient, to, to really maximize a deal. But we have capital to spend and we have deal flow we can find. And so what we do, you know, we partner up with general contractors we will actually give general contractors equity in the house so they can manage it, be there more and make it their own rather than just a job. 
we partner, you know, I flipped down in Arizona. Now I just moved down to Arizona part-time, so I'll be here more, but I liked the market. I liked the returns. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't have the time to find the contractors, time to find the deals, but I liked what the returns were giving. So I found a seasoned operator, Kara Beckman, and I finance with her and we do a split of the profit. And so you can find someone, an active operator that's doing all the hard work and they always have a need. And if they're a busy operator with an established business, capital can be a big need for them. Now, if you can provide the capital, you can then partner with the operator and get a portion of the profit. When I do that, I take 50% of the profit. And if the deal is going to make 40% return, I get half that. That's a 20% return that I have no effort or energy into. But you have to vet the people the right way. This is You have to make sure the deal works, the operator knows what they're doing, and that the wheels aren't coming off. And so I target operators that have been seasoned and in the business for a while, and then find out that solution. What's their solution? Capital, financing, uh, signatures on debt, whatever I can participate in, I will, but they got to run that project because I don't have the time. So what are the biggest mistakes that flippers make and when they lose money, you know, the weekend warriors who are like, oh, there's a house, I, I'm going to buy that and fix it up and sell it for a profit. But that's about all they know. <laughs> uh, flipping is a business that will give you absurdly high returns if you lever it correctly. You know, there's deals where we definitely have made over 100% return, 200%, even there's a deal where we made over 500% return on. And with that, though, comes in an inherent amount of risk. If you are investing in anything that can get you a 20 plus return, there's going to be a lot of risk in that. And so there's yeah. a lot of mistakes that can happen. And the thing with flipping is you're dealing with outside vendors and companies that really do dictate your success of the business. If you hire the wrong contractor and don't vet the contractor correctly, they can go way over time frame, way over budget, and they can erode your deal. And, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I because I've done that. I've partnered with contractors and it it went bust. Like it did not go well for me. So how do you vet a contractor? That is so hard. Yeah, vetting the contractor. So how 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 do we do it? Is you know, we have numerous different ways that we find them. Whether it's driving for dollars, we track permits, uh, we get referrals, and then it's about okay, then taking those steps. This step to vetting contractor. We pull their contractor's license. How but not we don't just ensure that they've been licensed and bonded or that they are we want to know how long and we look at the date and if the date is within a couple of years we want to know where did they work before that did they own any other construction companies have they ever shut them down that way we'll do searches on the person's name to see if they've been you know if i see a contractor that's had five contracting businesses over 10 years there's usually a problem there <laughs> yeah um, we want to make sure they have no active uh, claims against them um, we want to get, we drive their job sites. What active job sites are they doing now? And we'll go out and do a drive by. We want to see what's the progress. We look when those properties were purchased, where they at now. Is the job site clean? Is it, uh, are there people that are working when we drive by? Those are all things that we want to know. And, and so, but you want to check the license, check their bond, uh, verify their job sites, and then get some property addresses and talk to some people. Because if you, again, hire the wrong person, it's a major, major issue. But then yeah. it's also about the processes with them. You got to make sure that you're paying them not too advanced. You would never want to get too in, in front of that contractor. And so you really have to make sure that that person is established, they're qualified, and they will take that project through to you. Because that, again, that's how a lot of nine to five investors can do flipping. If you hire the right general, and you might pay a little bit more, they will run your job site if you set up the, the, the property correctly. Yeah, yeah, I could see that, uh, where you if you just can find the right team. It seems like, and this is off topic, but a lot of people in the in construction have addictions. And I'm, I'm just really being, I'm generalizing here, but showing up late, hungover. I don't know. Have you seen that? Uh, I have definitely seen that. I've had people sleeping in my job sites. I've had people uh, bringing their lady friends to the job <laughs> sites. We've had, well, I've seen it all. It, we, we saw people doing crack parties in our, in our properties. Yeah. We, I mean, it's it's been, been I've been through it all, man. But that's why I love your book. I, I want to. I actually want to do a flip. I don't know why. I feel like. I feel like to be a really established real estate investor, you have to have a good flip under your belt, right? Well, you know, I'm a firm <laughs> believer. You know, so we've been involved in over four thousand flip transactions, and so it is a painful business. It can be. There's good times. There's bad times. There's flat times. 
But the thing, the reason I'm such a proponent of flipping, because, you know, I hear this all the time, like, oh, you're paying way too much tax. I, why are you doing that? You can go bigger. You can you can do development that's way more systemizable because, you know, building a house is you can systemize that a lot better than flipping. But flipping gives me the high returns, but it also has taught me the most important skill set in investing. And that's how to create the right plan and manage costs. And I can take my yeah. flipping concept, right? We, we take an old house, we improve it with the right construction plan, manage that process, manage those costs, and we can create equity and we can create returns. And if I can control my processes better than my competitors, I can buy more deal flow from them. Because we hear all yeah. the time, there's not enough deals in the market. There's not enough deals in the market. I buy 75% of the deals on market. So anybody can buy this house. It's a matter of creating the right plan. And flipping teaches you that. And that what has been instrumental in our growth is because we have that talent, we can now go into apartment buildings and renovate them very cost effectively, very efficiently, and for less than other investors, which enhances the returns. And when you're in an expensive market, like I know you're in an expensive market, Kathy, yeah. you know, yeah. it's Seattle also expensive. It's hard. Yeah, you to can't find be one account. month overdue. Your, your overhead is going to kill you if you, if you, if you go over cost. Yeah, yeah your just... overhead. And, and it's so important to, to be able to create cash flow in our markets, good returns. You have to keep your basis low and create equity. And if I go into Seattle, I hear this all the time. You cannot get cash flow in Seattle. Returns are terrible. That's why I go to another state, which is other states provide a lot of simpler cash flow. But I want to be a backyard investor. And, and what that tells me is if a property doesn't need that much work, I'm going to get a pretty bad return. Mm -hmm. And just in our market, it's more expensive. It's competitive. Everyone will buy something that needs lipstick. You know, So you're buying the junk. We are buying the junk. And, and I've seen some photos that like. The poop house, for example. Oh, the poop house. God, that's a good house. <laughs> Can you believe Joe Rogan was talking about that house? I Joe Rogan talking about your poop house. I know. I, was like, I mean, oh. literally poop everywhere, like from a human, human, right? Yes. Yeah, so if anyone We're not talking Joe cats Rogan, and dogs here. I would love to come tell him the play-by-play -play of that house. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it gives us that competitive edge. So like recently, we just purchased a property in a class A neighborhood in Seattle, right off Lake Union, which is right where Amazon is. Beautiful area. We were able to buy nearly 30 units with views of the lake. Great businesses around you, great location. And we are able to achieve over a seven and a half cap in that neighborhood. The reason we can do that stabilized is because everyone we were bidding at against had a budget of 50 to 60,000 to renovate per unit because it had been broken into. There were squatters. They set it on fire. They stripped the electrical out. They stripped the plumbing out. It was gutted. Beautiful building got pulled apart by zombies. Our budget is 26,000 because we know how to manage those costs, have the right processes. So by cutting our rehab budget in half, we can take an average deal that numerous big companies with more money than us are, are bidding against. And we were able to outbid them and make it a better deal because we knew how to enhance the value with construction plan. And that's why I'm such a huge proponent of flipping because it teaches you how to maximize a deal. Yeah. And what I often see is that people get emotionally attached to the property and they want to make it really nice and they make it too nice, and then they've spent their profit. So, you know, sure, you can fall in love with a property and put all your profit into it, but that's not a business. I mean, do you see that where people just want to over-improve it? Yeah, number one rule in flipping, A, don't buy what you don't know, but B, two, don't fall in love. This house is not for you to love. It's for someone else to love. And so when we design houses, we are disciplined. We use data. We use comps. Like, what are we trying to achieve when we create the value? And then we stick to that plan because you have to have a lot of discipline with construction because it's also easy to, it's that game of, well, it's only 250 bucks more or only $500 yeah. more. And it's going to look so much nicer. But then if you do that hundred times, that could be 50 grand. Yes. It could be, you know, you do it 10 times. That could be 5,000 and 5,000 could be 10% of your profit. And so yeah, and your, your creative genius comes over. You're like, oh, well, I could do this and this. I mean, I, I feel like that's what I would end up doing. But it comes back down to discipline and having a plan and sticking with it. Yeah. And that's what the book talks about is like creating that framework for discipline. And, you know, where we really learned this was in 2000, you know, I got in the business 2005, market crashed on us in 2008. 
And we flipped our way out of a recession and bankruptcy, essentially. And we did that. Now, flipping homes 2008 to 2010, now that is complex because the houses were going down. <laughs> yeah, there was no financing for the buyer. <laughs> there's no financing. There was no, there's no dependable comps for the house because you don't know what's going to be worth in 90 days. And so we would factor in depreciation. We were very, we had to be very diligent about keeping our costs down because if we crept five grand on our budget, that could be 25% of the profit. The margins were very small back then. And so we learned this discipline and processes because we had to. And it, if we didn't stay disciplined, we were going to lose all our money. And so it, it really came down to, you know, establishing those steps, vetting the construction team, underwriting the deal correctly, finding a deal, being able to pull the comparables, not doing gut checks, really breaking down the data and going, okay, this is what this is worth. And then creating the plan to establish and create that value in your underwriting with an accurate budget, not guessing. Flipping is not for guessers. I hear this all the time. Like, well, I think yeah. the house needs a hundred grand. How? You've never done yeah. it before. <laughs> I mean, don't don't trust the sales agent on that. Oh, it's going to just take twenty grand for this. Yeah, no. Yeah, you have to verify. Verify, verify yeah. comps, verify costs, and it's up to you to do that and control that. And you know, my budget is going to be different than your budget if you flip a house, and mm-hmm. in depending on the location, numerous different things, and you have to put in your own numbers, not what everyone else is saying. And, and that's been the big difference is really underwriting, protecting, and then always building resources. People say the money's made on the buy, which is true, but the money's really made on the plan. Because again, if I'm paying market value for a house that anyone can buy and I'm creating profit, then it's really made on the plan, not the buy. I didn't get some exceptional buy. But how we create the right plan is by putting all the right pieces together with data. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, and having the right resources. And so I like to say like driving for dollars isn't about finding a deal. It's about finding more resources. The more resources I have in operators and contractors and in subcontractors, the more I can control my cost. And so we're always, always building resources. That is one of the most important things. And one of the biggest mistakes flippers make is they go chase the deal where they need to chase the actual pieces they need to implement the right plan on the deal. So good. Well, we are running out of time. Is there any last thoughts for our listeners who have been on the fence, kind of wanting to do a flip, but just not sure they have what it takes? Well, just open your open your minds. You know, mm-hmm. like I said, well, I did not succeed wholesaling and I thought it was a bad business. But I, what I had to do was go, well, no, I want to be involved. So what works for me to be successful? So if you want to flip mm-hmm. and you have the nine to five or you don't like construction, you don't want to deal with headaches, then come up with a solution. Don't just go, it's not possible because there is a salute. One thing I've learned in this business over 20 years is there is a solution to every problem. And it's about coming up with a solution and getting rid of the objection because you can still make high returns. If you partner with someone and give and you take half and you're making 20%, that's still really good. And so look for what is the solution that fits your lifestyle and your skill set, And then you can flip a house or do whatever you want in this business. Yeah. I love it. All right, James. Well, you, people are going to be hearing your name more often because you're filming a TV show now and you're uh, my co-host on Bigger Pockets on the Market. And now you've got your book, The House Flipping Framework. So uh, just, just everybody just know that you heard him here first. (laughs) All right. Can I come back more? I want to come back more. And let's do it. Absolutely. We'll take some questions. Yeah. You got questions for James, send them over to us at uh, uh, hello at Real Wealth and we'll bring them back and and, uh, get some answers. All right, James, thank you so much for being here on The Real Wealth Show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'll see you on on the market. See you on the market. (laughs) And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to learn more about our Build to Rent community that we're doing in San Antonio, Texas, in one of the top 10 fastest growing zip codes in the entire country where 
Rental properties are desperately needed. Just go to realwealthshow.com and click on the invest tab. You'll see the drop down for syndications there. It's going to be closing out soon. And a bunch of people missed out on our last syndication in Oregon. They were calling at the last minute saying, can I still get in? So don't let that be you. The deadline is coming up very quickly. This is going to be a great one. Again, I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks so much for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. And we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.